You know, I wanted to talk with you because there's all this talk about Ice Cube and 50 Cent and Kanye and Chance the Rapper and T.I. and all these hip-hop artists. And we talk about it on the show because at this point it's become a political story. But one of the things I've said on my show incessantly is that the reason why they go to these pop stars, and I do call them pop stars, is because having somebody in the room who is going to hold them accountable, that's a little bit too dangerous. Having somebody in the room who has actually worked to register folks to vote, who've actually worked on political campaigns, that's a little bit too dangerous, right? And I wanted to talk with you about this idea of being in the room and negotiating with somebody who was as devilish as Trump, especially a few weeks you know, before an election. You've never been in the room with Trump, but I feel like if you were, if you could be, I would want you there again to hold him accountable. But what do you think from a strategy perspective? You know, you're all about strategy, right? Strategy perspective. What, what do you think of this idea of we're talking to the other side two weeks before an election and we had a primary about a year ago and I, I, I vanished, but I'm showing up now. I want to be civically engaged now. What are your thoughts on that strategy, Eljoy Williams? Uh, well, you know, the thing about that type of strategy is I can't say that I would never suggest to anyone to be um, in the room with someone like Trump or, you know, any president or governor or anyone that people believe are outright, you know, against um, everything you may stand for. There may be strategic benefits to have identifying someone um, and having the right person go in a room and negotiate, but there are all sort of, sorts of caveats, right? <laughs> there is you know, um, is the person trustworthy based upon um, what they're going in to negotiate? Do they have a prior relationship that allows um, an openness? So I'll give you an example. Al Sharpton has a previous relationship and have uh, engaged with uh, Trump before, right? So that's one. He has a a pre-existing relationship um, and have had a camaraderie um, but also been on the antagonistic side, right? Um, say what anybody wants to say about Al Sharpton. I trust him to go oh, into a room and negotiate and based upon what is said and the issues and things that he uh, believes in. Um, but then there's also the time factor, right? It's two weeks before Election Day. Are we negotiating somebody's release? <laughs> you know, that he has the power um, as president to do, um, so going in and, and, and negotiating that kind of thing, negotiating a black agenda two weeks before election when someone has been in power three plus um, years to actually execute on that thing, To there's all those caveats. Have they been open to? Now, I firmly believe, as much as I despise Trump, he, you know, he ain't shit. He ain't never going to be shit, <laughs> like whatever, like in terms of my perspective. Um, you know, I, I forgot who said this. And like, we know he does things based upon ego. We know he, whoever is the last person in the room or anything like that. Right. So there may be strategic advantages to doing that for specific things for a long term black agenda that you can that you know that as soon as somebody else comes in the room that as soon as the senate gop gets ahead of a legislative agenda is going to nix it like any of those things i don't trust it and so with the celebrity sort of coming in at this space and doing it while i um wholeheartedly believe not discouraging people no matter what moment they wake up from being civically engaged like providing space for them to do that but there's, again, the difference of ego and saying that coming late to the party and believing you're the savior, right, like that you can negotiate the big thing um, and being able to play your position in a way that uplifts and empowers everybody instead of just you. Um, and th- those telltale signs of ego, of something that you negotiated and um, um, then going further, as I saw on Ice Cube's um, Sort of, he's like starting to reach out to elected. Your bill needs to be stronger and things like that. It's like, all right, dude. Like, you know, again, that's ego. I called you and it's been a week, you know, kind of A thing. week. I called um, you a week ago about right. reparations. 
a week, <laughs> not knowing the kind of work that folks have been do- doing for years and years on it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, the same thing, right? And so that level of ego, that tells me who you are really concerned about. And it's you. It is not a, a position of you being humble of saying, oh, I know I don't know everything. I know this and I have um, uh, the ear. I got the attention. I have a celebrity. So what can I do in this you know, standpoint? I look to those people. Right, because we like to use a lot, Clay, the example people go to, well, Muhammad Ali and Harry Belafonte talking about all of the activists and celebrities that um, have been throughout our culture. And there's a, there's a clear difference. You can see the clear difference of artists who have been engaged, but they use their limelight strategically. And when they do, they are usually bringing other people who know more about the subject who have been advancing the issue, right? I just watched a documentary about the week that Harry Belafonte um, uh, hosted the, was it Tonight Show? I think it was. Um, And so he could have talked by himself about the civil rights movement or about any issues, but he provided space to bring Martin Luther King on to talk about it. He provided space to bring Bobby Kennedy on to talk about, you know, the political space. So it's using the limelight using the attention that you have um, in any space. I don't care if you a local celebrity, if you're the local rapper, and, you know, that everybody goes to for some, like you still have some sort of platform and being able to use that um, to amplify what's being done rather than amplifying and push, putting yourself up as a savior. Right. That's such a good point because I don't think what any of us are saying is shut up and sing or, or shut up and rap. It's just make sure that you're informed because you have a lot of power. And what you bring up is, is really important. Nina Simone, Harry Belafonte, uh, Lena Horne. Uh, you know, I said this, I said this last week. Imagine if Lena Horne would have had a secret meeting with George Wallace, right? You know, at a hotel, uh, because, because she just felt like Dr. Martin Luther King wasn't getting the work done. That would have been outlandish, right? And of course, we might think right. there is no Dr. Martin Luther King right now, but nonetheless, there are still activists who are doing really, really important work who are trying to penetrate those rooms. Reverend Al Sharpton, he tried to meet with Trump. He tried to work with Trump. Trump refused. Uh, Elijah Cummings, I can go on and on and on. So that's just really an important right. point that, oh, well, celebrities have done it. Yeah, they've done it. But, but Harry Belafonte knew, listen, I'm, I'm a smart guy. I am an activist. But it's important to have Dr. King there. It's important to have policymakers there, right? Uh, so let me ask you this. Let's just set the stage. Let's say you were in the room. Let's say for some bizarre reason – I don't know, in 2018, I mean, at this point you would say no because you have an agenda right now. You've seen what he does. But let's say for some right. bizarre reason you were in the room, or let's say in 30 years we have another horrific, uh, you know, Trumpish kind of kind of president, and you, and you managed to be in the room. So give us some ideas of, for folks, you know, we have a lot of diverse listeners, for folks who managed to make it in the room with someone as insidious as that, whether it's uh, in the government, whether it's your governor, mayor, president, what, what would you say would be some basic negotiating agenda items you should have walking in that room? G- give, give folks some tips. You know what's interesting is I did a whole show about this. <laughs> um, so I talked about, like, one, how you prepare yourself and the people you're going in the room with. Having the clear agenda, this is what we are, uh, we're planning to talk about. Here is um, where we stand on these issues, being able to back it up and clearly articulate things. Um, and for me, even in a negotiating room in that instance, I don't, I don't go in those kinds of conversations believing that I'm going to shake the hand, you know, do the handshake or the agreement there. I still got people I got to take it back to. And I uh. make that clear in the conversation. Like, look, we are representative of you know, uh, whether it's activists, groups, or whoever, say we're focusing on voting rights, right? I have to be in the room, um, but other groups aren't. The ACLU isn't. Common Cause isn't. Um, NAACP Legal Defense Fund isn't for some bizarre reason, right? Um, But if I go in and they're like, we have a deal on these things, I'm like, well, you know, I think we can maybe get somewhere, but I need to go back and talk to, (laughs) you know, my people because I can't make a decision solely on behalf of all black people, on behalf of all, like, I, to think that you can do that, 
right? To think that even the, the plans that we have for a black agenda or anything like that, it is not presenting it as if this is the only plan that every black person is going to agree to. We ratified it at the black meeting two days ago. You know what I mean? Like you still have to go back, right, and have the conversation. Case in point, um, the uh, Van Jones negotiating with um, uh, Trump on a criminal justice pack on the um, bill Jared that Kushner. was passed. Right. There are a lot of other folks involved that were saying, OK, we need this didn't go far enough here. We need to do you know, we need to do this. The first step back I'm talking about, you know, sort of all that stuff. People were upset. Right. Partly because he didn't come back and engage and said, we have been working collectively on this. You going out and unilaterally saying that we all agree with this, that this is all thing, is a problem. <laughs> right. Because you don't speak for everyone. And so being that arrogant to believe this is the black agenda and we all need to lockstep without having one, a history of engaging with uh, groups and um, uh, folks that have been working on the issue, but even to not bring it back and say, look, I happen to be in the meeting with the guy at a hotel. We talked about, <laughs> you know, the black agenda. He said he would do all of these things. What do you guys think? Right. Then you get the benefit of people telling you, he ain't shit. Like, like, he'll never be able to get that. Or that's interesting that you got to him to that point. We have been trying to get him to X. You got him to Z. We can work with that, right? So it's this collective ability um, to be able to ne negotiate and engage um, unless you're in the position, unless the Black community then vetoed, uh, then um, voted collectively and was like, we sending in Ice Cube on our behalf. And when you send someone, you are sending them with the agenda. You are sending them with the negotiating point. You are sending them with the backup. You are sending them prepared to be in the room. If you go in there by yourself, who prepared you? Or allegedly to a hotel outside of the White House because you didn't want to see being spotted in the White House. <laughs> That's a problem. Though, but listen, those are really important points that you brought up, right? Because it is about the collective. Because if you care about the black agenda, then you would know that it is about the collective. Now, it shouldn't take an article from Politico, allegedly, to say that you sat down with someone like, like a, a, a Jared Kushner. That it really is about that. And what, it, what it's feeling like right now, that it's more about the person than it, more, than it is about the community. And I think, and, I, and again, right now, Trump has shown us who he is. All right, let me read this to you. 50 Cent, he tweeted this out. What the F? Vote for Trump. I'm out. F, <laughs> F New York, the Knicks never win anyway. I don't care Trump doesn't like black people. 60, 62% are you out of your effing mind? He's talking about the tax rate that he doesn't understand. Uh, that says people making above $400,000 will pay more in taxes. Not 62%. It's a percentage depending on, on, on how much you make. This is what 50 Cent says. And I was saying this on Twitter. 50 Cent doesn't care that Trump doesn't like black people. He literally admits that. And folks paying more money in taxes, folks paying, more, folks paying a bit more, if you make a certain amount, is too much for him. Then you got to think of all the folks who made under $100,000 a year, under $50,000 a year, under $40,000 a year that contributed to him being a multimillionaire. And I, again, I was saying it on Twitter. It is greed over community and black folks exploiting black folks. I don't think the solution is black capitalism. I don't want a black boss to exploit a black worker. I don't want a black, I, was, I saw this on Twitter. I don't want a black landlord to exploit a black tenant. That isn't the answer for me. I don't want to see a black bank put another black person just in, in, in deep debt as the white bank does. And then um, my boy Keith Boykin, who I adore, he's often on, on CNN. He really put, and I'm, and I'm careful with analogies when it comes to, uh, to slavery, but I liked what he wrote here. Just, you know, it's a bit of a metaphor. Where is this here? Uh, he said, okay, I don't have it in front of me, but he said, he's, he said something like, uh, I don't care if my brothers and sisters are enslaved as long as I get 30 silver coins, right? Mm. And that kind of hit me. 
because you literally are okay. And, and mind you, the rich, they have so many loopholes for taxes. Even if you are at that 60% threshold, there are so many loopholes, so many tax breaks, you're still not going to pay that. The amount of money that I pay in taxes, and I don't make anywhere close to that, I don't make over 200000 I don't make anywhere close to that. The, the amount that I pay in taxes, it's insane. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, you literally have somebody, somebody saying he's okay if you don't like black folks, but it's got to benefit me. I think this should never be forgiven because, you know, God willing, Biden wins. Remember all their names, y'all. They're going to all want to go on the, oh, I had it wrong. They're going to want to all go on the apology tour or they're going to want you to forget because we are forgiving people. Some folks forgave R. Kelly too many times. But what are your thoughts on this when you see when you see 50 Cent literally saying, I don't care. Trump doesn't like black people. Taxes, money, profit. It doesn't surprise me. Um, number one, there are a number of lessons just in that number in that tweet, right? <laughs> he didn't even have to do like a Twitter rant. Um, so number one, the fact that wealthy people do not care whether or not you like them, um, whether or not you, uh, I, you know, respect their identity, their um, uh, sexuality, or anything like that. There, are, you know, there are some wealthy people that their focus is about their money. Right. Um, And that has always been to me something that 50 Cent has projected. Like, I don't you know what I mean? Like, that has always been something he's projected that he's about his money. So for me, I him making the decision to do that based upon his ill, uh, uneducated view of what the tax rate is doesn't surprise me at all. Um, The second lesson in in this as well, and I tweeted this yesterday, I was like, I don't care if it's a Democratic celebrity or Republican celebrity, like vote your own interest. <laughs> like that's, that's definitely, mm. um, and not your aspirational interest, but what your interest is at the moment, right? To so you believing that, well, when I get to 50 cent money, I don't want to do this. Well, you ain't at 50 cent money right now. <laughs> so like based upon where you are right now, what is in your best interest? And as you mentioned, he's uneducated about the tax rate. Like he has uh, people that he pays that will make sure, I don't care if the tax rate is 62% or 67%, he'll pay less than that because he hires people to insure and there are loopholes for him to do so. But the last piece I would say is that we have to de-emphasize overall, um, and, and those of us who are consultants and practitioners, we're part of the problem, right? We dangle celebrities and their endorsements and um, look, they're phone banking for us, they're door knocking for us or whatever. Um, it's the, the, the carrot, I guess, um, or the cake <laughs> that we kind of use to get people to pay attention um, in a political space that sometimes people tune out. And so bringing in, you know, the cast of Hamilton, bringing in 50 Cent mm. or Ice Cube or sort of any of those kinds of folks um, is, is something that is done. But then look at the response of a GOP party. Right. Where I see on Twitter, like they're posting a picture of Ice Cube and 50 Cent with like the Trump, like using them as a marketing tool. There is no real engagement. And this is part of um, there are black conservatives that consistently talk about this all the time. That um, this is like y'all just keep talking about black people being slaves on the plantation. You're not really engaging on any issues or anything that black people care about. There's a natural uh, a base of black conservatives that you're not engaged in, you just keep doing the old racist tropes. So like your basic ass, even <laughs> like responses, even in recruiting and engaging people. And I asked this question, Clay, on Twitter. Anybody, you know, everybody talking about the plan that Trump got or whatever, did Ice Cube talk about it or did a GOP organizer talk to you about it? Right? Did you see information about uh, Republicans in communities in Baltimore and New York um, uh, in Compton, actually engaging people in conversation about what the Republican plan is um, to uplift Black communities or invest in Black communities. No, you never see that type of engagement. What you see is this marketing. What you see is using celebrities, talking to them about their tax bracket, and then dangling that in front of Black folks and saying, see Ice Cube, see 50 Cent, like see these people, rather than any real engagement. You ought to be offended at that. Right. No matter what we and believe me, both I know you do, uh, you, Clay and myself, 
you know, we have a lot of criticisms about the Democratic Party that we make very public. Yeah, absolutely. Engagement. I've interviewed them. But I guess you, right. But they'll call you and talk to you about, well, what That's do you think right. about this plan? Uh, we're putting this out. What do you think about it? Can we bring, put somebody on your show to talk about it? Right? That's like, right. there's at least an engagement that we talk to these 120 activists all across the country. Some of them like the plan, some of them don't, but there was at least engagement, right? So to think that we would get something substantial from a president, from an administration, and from a party that continues to treat us in that kind of disrespect, and that you would two weeks before an election come up with some master plan that you had the ability to do in the last three years? Nah, man, I don't trust it. As the kids say, that's sus. (laughs) <laughs> right, right, right. That's us. You know, the other thing, too, is that I also think, and this is complicated for me because I know both you and I were of the hip hop generation. I also think a part of it is the the issues of hip hop kind of coming to the surface. And what I mean by that, although I mean, I don't I'm more no 90s hip hop than 80s hip hop and 80s hip hop was a bit more um, had a bit more diversity as far as the messaging, I would argue. But, you know, when I'm growing up, it's gangster rap, it's money, 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 it's, it's you know, Chanel Nine Boots, uh, you know, Adrian Vettadini, it's Gucci, Gucci, Versace, Versace, like it's all these things, right? And I can recall people telling me, older people at the time telling me, like, this is an issue. Like, they're really pushing uh, some horrible, horrible aspirational narratives that you're never going to be able to reach. And they're not even, tell you, not, even, not even telling you how to reach it. Then they're going bankrupt. Right. So I think there is there's it's something even like that Cardi B song, um, money, da, 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 money, money. Right. I, I heard it and I was like, damn, like we're still here. And I'm not saying there aren't some, uh, quote unquote, conscious rappers, but I've interviewed the conscious rappers and they say we really can't get on radio. And if we do, we got to be featured with like the other kind of artists. So I think part of it is the the, the challenges of hip hop just kind of coming up to the, I mean, these are like 90s rappers or early 2000s rappers coming to the surface that this is what they focused on. And we're still here with it. And they still have a voice. They, you know, KRS-One doesn't have the kind of voice that Ice Cube has. And I used to, Ice Cube in many ways was revolutionary or whatever, whatever, but it's it, not revolutionary, but just was, you know, talking about status quo. But, you know, now he's a massive capitalist. And I, and I really think some of these lines that, that I see, uh, it is on racial lines, but it's also on lines of class. Just because you're a rich black person does not mean you have my best interest at heart. Go ahead, Eljoy. Yeah, I, I would say similar to that. You talked earlier about not wanting a uh, a black landlord to exploit, you know, uh, their rent, a black rentee, you know, not wanting a black banker to exploit their black community. And I, I, I think to your point, there's this education piece as well that, you know, we, the phrase now is, you know, capitalism is black capitalism is going to save us, but what does it mean to have both and be a, like engaged in a way that is not predatory? Exactly. Right. Um, so I've been using previously predatory capitalism, right? Mm. In that way that we talked about on Sunday, we have this belief that if I, um, if you um, gain wealth, right, that you're taking something from me, and therefore I also have to um, assume the role of the predator. That means that I need to um, pay my workers as little as possible. I'm assuming those predatory behaviors. What we have to break is that you do not have to do that in order to be wealthy, right? You do not have to pay people as little as possible. Actually, if you pay people a living wage, it actually increases your business. Like it's impactful for your business, right? You um, gaining wealth, the people next to you are gaining as well is collective wealth, is collective stability, right? But we have this, again, the scarcity mindset of that I have to get for only me. And if I let up a little bit, if I let you enjoy a little bit, if I let you catch up to me, somehow I'm losing. You're a threat. Um, And that kind of scarcity, um, that um, assuming a predator nature, which um, Reverend Lawson now calls plantation uh, capitalism, right? A plantation capitalist system of like, you, there still has to be people below me in order for my wealth to mean something. And that's something we have to break. 
I agree. And let me be clear. For me, I know you, you as well, I'm not anti-wealth at all. I'm not anti-wealth in any capacity. I think it's important to be financially literate. What I, what I am against, like I was saying, is the exploitation. And let me give you an example. Maybe, the, maybe he didn't know any better. Uh, maybe there's some, there's some more details that I'm not aware of. But when you think about someone like Diddy, who was saying hold the vote hostage in April, here is somebody who reportedly, allegedly, exploited people on his record label and didn't fairly pay them. And according to Mace, allegedly, reportedly, uh, is not giving him a fair share of his publishing. That is exploitation. So it's great that you're a bad boy for life. It's great that you're all of that, but it's not good that you are literally exploiting reportedly, allegedly, other artists who had a dream, had a goal, had an aspiration, and now, you know, Mace can't even get his catalog back, you know? I think about someone, um, I think about Faith Evans, for example, when, when, when the notorious B.I.G. passes away, she didn't have to do this, but she made sure that she shared 50% of Biggie's publishing with his mother. Now, she didn't have to do that at all because she's married to him, but she, but she decided to do that because it was fair, and she didn't want to exploit her husband's right. mother who was suffering with, the, with the, the death of her son. That's what I'm talking about. It's not just getting money and buying some property and whatever the case may be. It's what are you doing with it? So I'm, not, I'm, I'm pro-wealth. I don't want anybody to be poor. I grew up poor as hell, but I'm not about exploiting people or thinking that because you're rich and famous, because you have money, you are suddenly an expert on, on anything. That would be like El Joy, you waking up tomorrow, deciding you want to be a rapper, and and then you get outraged if you don't have a number one hit. Like, how dare they? <laughs> how dare they? Well, I'm not number all, one. <laughs> because we are hip hop generation, I did have a rap, you know, a, a little rap thing. My name was Shorty Love. Like, I'm from <laughs> Queens. Like, I did have my moment. Um, but, but it was only on mixtapes. It was only on mixtapes. <laughs> <laughs> There's some good stuff on mixtapes. 